When Google announced Glass back in 2012, people couldn't decide if it was the future or a mistake, but it proves something really important. If you can put computing on your face without it feeling awkward, everything can change. 13 years later, I'm back on Google's campus after an hour of hands-on time with some new XR hardware that finally feels a little closer to delivering on that original idea, especially a new prototype called Aura, which is built in collaboration with Xreal. I wasn't allowed to film Aura since it's still early, but I did get to use it, and that alone says a lot about where we are right now. Now, last year, I tried early Project Astra prototypes, and I really walked away thinking this could all actually work. And today, Aura showed me the middle ground AR has been missing. Pin displays, full six degree tracking, and a form factor that doesn't feel like you're suiting up for combat. I also sat down with Google's Senior Director of Product Management for XR, Justin Payne, to understand what problems Aura is meant to solve and where this is all headed and so much more. But before we get there, let's look at the other prototype hardware Google was itching to show off today. My time at the demo made something very clear to me, that Google is playing a strong platform game first and foremost. And the biggest lesson that they've carried forward from the old Google Glass days is that a platform only really scales if developers have a smooth on-ramp to develop for it. I spent time, once again, with two prototype forms of what Google has called in the past their Astro Glasses. I tested a monocular version, that's one lens, and a binocular version that has two displays in it. Neither are consumer products yet, but the monocular version will be seeded as developer kits timed with the Android Show XR edition. And they really represent the clearest demonstration of how Android XR is supposed to work. When I put on the monocular glasses my third time with this hardware since first trying them one year ago, I noticed how standard Android notifications have actually become low-lift XR experiences. Max Spear, who's product lead of XR at Google, explained. There's actually all the same uh, Android notifications that we're running on the phone. We call rich ongoing notifications mm -hmm. that are automatically adapted to glasses. Okay. And so with no work from the YouTube music app and team, they now have a glasses experience. Low lift. And when wearing the glasses, I can definitely say that it looks fully integrated and very intentional. I took a Google Meet call through the glasses as well, and I saw the caller's video inside of my display, and with the double tap, the caller actually saw exactly what I was seeing too. And again, Google didn't rewrite Meet for XR for this to work. I actually cooked my entire Thanksgiving turkey with my dad, sharing my view in a display. Of course a, you in did. A display that like, <laughs> but he was like back in Canada. I didn't have a display, at a, the model that doesn't have a display. Yeah. But being able to see what you see and stay hands-free is actually a super powerful for use sure. case. The same platform philosophy extends to Maps and Uber. Visual positioning uses the glasses cameras to know exactly where you are, which can be super helpful when you're someplace unfamiliar. We actually use visual positioning from the glasses too, to note exactly when you are at like a certain part of the intersection to know when to take that turn. Or if you've ever like come out of the subway in New York and you don't know which way to go, mm -hmm. the visual positioning combined with the GPS helps you exactly localize where you are and where you're facing. This is also helpful as it can do things like turn off the display when it senses that you're standing in the middle of a crosswalk so you can pay more attention and be safer. Justin actually told me about how form factors like this are so understandable, even his child can use it. I was on a um, family trip in Rome over the summer and I put those glasses onto my 10 year old. And I was like, where do you want to go? I want to get gelato. So then that maps experience comes up and it, you know, the little place card, you know, walk 300 meters, like, yeah. okay, turn right. So then my wife, daughter, and I could then follow our 10 year old through the sort of winding streets of Rome while he navigated us. That's amazing. And there's something <laughs> about, it is that. It's yeah. like, there's something about that, like 
like 10 year old test. Yeah, you know? that's a strong example of how intuitive the system is. And when it came to Uber, the notification showed up just like you might experience on your phone. But here's the thing. It would have worked even if Uber did nothing special. So that rich ongoing notification, the first thing that you saw, yeah. that you then tapped into, that would appear there even if we weren't partnered with Uber and they didn't want to do anything. That would just work. Now, Uber did choose to add a few extra lines of code so that when you glance down, their airport map appears in your view. I got to check that out. That extra effort definitely made the experience even better. The binocular version of the Astro Glasses added depth, literally, as you can imagine. The map had dimensionality. You could scroll in and out. You could actually see buildings in 3D space and three-dimensional pins on the map. But one of the really cool moments that I experienced with the binocular glasses was watching the film Super Mario Brothers in native 3D. Yes, I could still see the room behind the video because these are see-through displays after all, but the screen was bright enough that I could really enjoy the film like that. I could definitely picture myself watching movies on glasses like this on an airplane. Now, all of this is made possible because Google was so early to this. Google Glass was, in my opinion, far ahead of its time. Maybe now is the time where acceptance, technical capabilities, and form factor might mean it can actually and finally deliver on its original promises. I actually went back and I watched the original glass like vision video. It shows a guy wearing glass walking around New York City. Mm. And he's getting these perfectly timed pieces of information where he was going. And there's this one vignette that really resonated with me, which is that he was about to walk into the six train and it said like subway services suspended or something. Mm. And I was like, oh, like that is like the best like product vision. Like this is truly a like shut up and give like take yeah. my money kind of moment sure. where I was like, that is so incredible. At the time that functionality wasn't quite ready. The infrastructure to support it wasn't there, but with Android XR, things are a little bit different. But one of Android XR's greatest strengths is that developers are already building XR apps simply by building Android apps. AI and XR aren't separate products anymore. They're becoming one experience. And to that end, Google isn't bolting AI onto these devices. They're baking Gemini into the foundation from the start. And what I experienced really reaffirmed that these two technologies were just made to work together. We're making the investments to make it so that it can take in all these rich signals, you know, physical world, digital world, your context, your voice, all these things. And it's fast enough so that you can have a conversation with it. That just so happens to be perfect for XR devices. During the kitchen demo, Gemini looked at the ingredients on the counter, identified what was there, even suggested a dessert that I could make and what I'd need to do it. It walked me through each step. We are doing some work. Um, there's a little initiative where we're calling internally called Expert Helper. Things like cooking or you know fixing a car or bicycle or putting together furniture are all like these how-to multi-step journeys that we're gonna be working with the Gemini team to make great on glasses too. And critically, it works whether you can see a display or not. Sometimes you'll have glasses that don't have a display, right? So we wanna make sure that that works. And sometimes even when you have a display, you don't wanna be distracted. For example, when you're cutting vegetables, mm -hmm. you might want that display off and Gemini can still talk to you just mm -hmm. as easily. The camera demo on the glasses definitely took me by surprise. I took a picture of Justin, I asked him to throw a peace sign, and then I actually sent that picture to Nano Banana from the glasses, asking for him to be placed in a field of daisies. Just a few seconds later, the AI edited version appeared in front of my eyes inside the glasses. And now, by the way, both the edited picture and the original are saved on the connected smartphone, so you don't lose anything. This was what Max called a compound query, and it made for a very powerful demo. The live translate demo showed automatic language detection and real-time translation that actually tries to match the speaker's cadence. So you can have visual text, audio only, or both, which can be really useful for different accessibility needs. This translate models is actually match the intonation and the cadence of the mm -hmm. person speaking, which actually makes it easier to follow along, even though there is that latency in translation, of course. Now, in my experience in the demo, hearing both the 
speaker in the room and the translated audio in my ears was a little bit cacophonous to me and might actually require some practice on the part of the wearer to really cut through that noise in everyday use. On the Galaxy XR headset, I saw a preview of what happens when you give Gemini the ability to draw on top of the world. We actually played a quick game of I Spy, you remember that game, and Gemini visually highlighted the objects that I was describing. This visual annotation feature is actually coming next year and represents how Gemini is becoming something that can point, it can highlight, and guide you through physical space. Overall, together, AI and XR are incredibly compelling when they're sandwiched together, and I continue to believe that these two technologies were just made for each other. All right, before we get to the part that genuinely surprised me, the prototype that I wasn't actually allowed to film, if you're into future of computing stuff like this, go ahead and hit subscribe, maybe like this video. I'm covering all the key moves in XR, AI, and ambient tech as they happen, and I want you to be along for the ride. All right, we gotta talk about the big surprise, the Project Aura prototype. Now, just a reminder, I wasn't allowed to photograph or film the Aura headset. I had to turn my cameras around for this part of the demo. It's still an early prototype, but I did get to use it. And here's what it is. Project Aura is a collaboration between Google and Xreal. It's a wired XR glasses system. The glasses themselves actually connect to a separate smartphone shaped compute pack that handles all the processing and battery. So none of that's on the glasses themselves. It actually contains the same Snapdragon XR2 Gen 2 chip that's found inside the Galaxy XR headset. It also has the battery, of course. Now the Surface is a flat touchscreen that acts as an additional input method, but it's not a glass display, it's just a touchpad. Now all of this means that the glasses are pretty light, about 90 grams for this prototype anyways. They have a 70 degree field of view and optical see-through technology. That basically means digital content can layer directly onto your view of the physical world. And if you're wondering what they look like, I have the Rainio Air 3S Pro here. They're roughly similar in form factor, so you can get a, a sense of the general idea, but they're definitely very different in execution. VR headsets are powerful, but they're also heavy and they're fully immersive in a way that cuts you off from the world. AI glasses, like the Astro prototypes, are lightweight and all day wearable, but they're limited by smaller displays and less processing power. Aura sits between them, full six degrees of freedom tracking, pin displays that stay locked in place wherever you put them, hand tracking with two onboard tracking cameras, and then also a temple position camera for shooting pictures and video. But the distinction is a form factor that doesn't require strapping a massive headset to your face. The onboarding process when I put them on was identical to what you get on the Galaxy XR. Same Unity-based app, same hand tracking system, same gestures, all that stuff. I was definitely impressed, by the way, by the fidelity of those displays. In one part of the demo, I used PC Connect to wirelessly link to a laptop, a Windows laptop, and place that window alongside native Android XR apps inside the glasses. I watched YouTube tutorials while referencing what I was working on. I would look up to the video and then look down at my work and everything stayed pinned and persistent. It was really cool. And then came Damio, the tabletop dungeon crawler game. This was awesome. The game board appeared on the table in front of me, fully spatialized, of course. I could zoom, I could rotate with platform native hand gestures. The visual clarity was just excellent. And really the whole thing reminded me of Jerry Ellsworth's Tilt 5 hardware from a number of years ago that really focused on virtual tabletop gaming. This was essentially that experience, but running on Android XR without the developers even knowing Aura existed. Now I should be really clear about what Aura isn't. These glasses have a relatively closed off field of view compared to see-through Astro glasses, kind of similar again to the Ray Neos with the display on the inside. I personally wouldn't choose to walk down the street wearing them. Vision, in my experience, uh, was blocked enough that it wouldn't feel safe enough for me to do that. 
but for episodic use, Aura is perfect. So XRail, you know, they've been a leader in the space of these wired XR glasses for a while. Their their usage patterns are episodic. You know, you you, you put them on and to watch you have a movie. reason for putting them. Yeah, on. that's the main divide in term in in terms of our thinking that we see between something that's an episodic and a like all day device. Okay. Personally, I see these as the ideal airplane headset. You can get work done with multiple pinned windows, watch immersive content, play games, all with a much more versatile footprint than a full VR headset. Aura really fills the missing middle ground in XR. It's less effort than a full headset, more immersion than simple glasses. It's not trying to replace either category. It's just offering a portable, powerful, see-through AR experience for the moments when you want more than glasses, but don't want to fully check out a reality. Google says we're going to learn more about these glasses in 2026. Now, I have to quickly mention the Galaxy XR updates that are rolling out alongside all of this because, well, in particular, one of the new features is very exciting to me. Auto spatialization is finally here, system-wide. It's rolling out this week, in fact. This is something I first heard about and experienced at the Samsung event in New York a few months ago, and seeing it in action again for the second time was just as impressive. This time around, I chose the F1 movie trailer, a flat 2D video, and watched it as it immediately turned it into something that looked genuinely 3D with just 20 milliseconds of latency in order to make that happen in real time. I honestly, I never would have guessed it wasn't a native 3D movie. The video itself is just a flat 2D video. We didn't run any pre-processing on it. And the system is actually taking the, the feed that you're seeing and then adding a depth layer. It does all of this by analyzing system metadata and context to determine what content is right for this function. So video, images, games, and then determining what content to leave alone. Things like UI elements. I also got to try PC Connect. So that's streaming a game from the laptop. The game in this instance was Stray. This is a cat adventure game that looked fantastic. It also looks like a lot of fun. And I was actually able to control it with hand gestures that actually pass through to the PC from the headset. So all that control passes through. It can handle 60 frames per second over Wi-Fi. That's rolling out in beta now. My time during this demo made three things very clear to me. First, Android XR's strength, and I'd say the biggest lesson Google learned from Google Glass, is making the platform dynamic for apps without developers needing to do anything. That creates a real incentive for them, the developers, to add to the experience as these form factors mature. Second, baking Gemini into the core of Android XR from the beginning really does transform the scale and the impact of immersive technology. AI and XR kind of like chocolate and peanut butter. And Google keeps revealing how deeply these technologies merge into something that will only grow more compelling as hardware gets smaller while retaining immersive and augmented capabilities. And third, there's a genuine need for a middle tier XR approach, the kind that Project Aura from Xreal notably fills. Not as heavy as an experience as you get from like true VR headsets, but more immersive than AI glasses alone. Google sees XR as the next computing platform, you mm -hmm. know, and we think that this is going to be a major computing platform. It's really in its infancy. There's momentum out there for sure, but the history is not written at all. And Justin told me 2026 may be exciting, but just wait for what's in store in 2027. Now we've talked all about how Aura could make spatial computing finally feel practical, but that's just one piece of the puzzle. What if the real shift isn't in the hardware, but in how we stop thinking about apps altogether? And in my full interview with Justin Payne, he explains the bigger vision behind Android XR, where ambient computing replaces apps, AI anticipates intent, and spatial technology fades into the background until you need it. And you can find that full interview on the AI Inside podcast. Just search for the AI Inside show channel here on YouTube. 
and you can drop a comment. Would you actually want your devices to predict what you're trying to do before you ask? Is now the right time for that? I'm Jason Howell. Thanks to Google for the cool opportunity to check out all this hardware. Thanks to Victor Bognat for editing this piece, my amazing patrons for supporting my work directly, and thank you for watching this look at Android XR and Project Aura. We'll see you in the next one.